Cast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. Hope you're doing well today. Uh, you may recognize me. It's Brittany Melville with Next Generation. Um, we have a few special guests here today that are going to bring you some, um, some unique education. And then we're going to do something a little bit different today than what we typically do. Typically, we focus specifically on self-directed IRAs and um, how those work with different types of investments. But today we're going to take more of a global look at alternative investing in general. And we're going to talk about some best practices um, for incorporating alternative assets into your portfolio and how to avoid making some of those common mistakes. So we hope you enjoy the education session today. Uh, you should be able to see here our host, Becca Hennessy. Uh, Becca is going to go ahead next, and she's going to introduce our special guest speaker, Dr. Paul Wendy. But before we do that, I just want to quickly mention a couple things. Um, we have about an hour slated for the session today, and the broadcast is being recorded. So if for any reason you missed us live, or if you have to jump off, we will be sending a copy of this recording out to everyone who registered. Um, as well, if you have any questions throughout the session, please feel free to enter them into the question box on the right-hand side of your panel. I'm going to take a look at those, and then I'll read those out um, either as we go or once we get to the end, depending on when it's appropriate, um, and then we can field those questions for you. Uh, with that, let's get started. Becca, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you so much, Brittany. Um, we're very excited to be here today. And first of all, I want to thank Next Generation Trust Company for inviting us to present here today. I'm your host, Rebecca Hennessy. Before I introduce you to Dr. Paul Wendy, let me tell you a couple of things. Our purpose today is to educate and empower you and help you make a good, well-informed decision with your investment portfolio. In this webinar, Dr. Paul Wendy will show you the three biggest mistakes investors make in their portfolios, how to avoid them, how to bulletproof your portfolio, the secret to picking a great alternative investment, plus you're going to learn how to protect your wealth while maximizing your upside potential and dramatically lowering your risk. You'll learn what true diversification is and the magic ingredient to a well-balanced portfolio. Plus, we're going to show you how you can incorporate alternative investments into your retirement accounts. We're going to show you the strategies that the half percent of hedge fund managers use. Plus, we're going to show you the secrets the most profitable hedge fund managers use, the secrets no one else will, will ever tell you. But first, I want to introduce you to Dr. Paul Wendy. Dr. Paul Wendy holds a doctorate in business administration and finance. He has spent the last 38 years obsessively studying, researching, investing, and teaching some of the most powerful investment strategies that bring higher returns, and most importantly, at a much lower risk. Dr. Wendy has dedicated his life to studying, learning, and teaching some of the most powerful and profitable investment strategies you'll find anywhere. He began his career early on in the research department of First Affiliated Securities. Then he later moved into the due diligence departments of Anchor National Life and Anchor Financial Services. And from there, he became a portfolio manager to the famous Harris Bank Corp. Dr. Wendy later was the Director of Corporate Finance and Director of Equity Research for Brook Street Securities, a major independent investment banking firm. And then he moved on to senior management positions at Evergreen Realty, where he started and managed the firm's real estate investment trust. Dr. Wendy also started his own investment banking firm, South Lake Avenue Securities Corporation, which specialized in the syndication of alternative investments. Clearly, he understands how important it is to perform due diligence. As an investment banker, he has more than 38 years of experience with successful funds in the alternative markets, and they range all the way from real estate to private equity. Plus, he's a Forbes publication contributor. The reasons why Dr. Paul Wendy is so unique is his extreme passion, along with his absolute transparency and his strong business acumen. Let me give you a little more information about Dr. Paul Wendy and why the message he will give you today is so important to you. A number of times in this webinar, you'll hear the word unique being used. And there are a couple of things that are in fact unique about what we have here today. What makes Dr. Paul Wendy unique? 
He is unique because of his 38 years of experience and his passion for financial wealth building and educating everyone who's interested in building their financial wealth. His doctoral thesis is centered on a financial concept known as intrinsic value. It is the basis of how he assesses and values all of his investments. As you learn more about what Dr. Paul Wendy does, you will see that it is the same as the very top multi-billion dollar hedge fund managers. But the unique difference is, instead of working with multi-billion dollar hedge funds, he has been able to apply these same principles directly to help smaller portfolios. Because your goals are preserving your wealth, maximizing your upside potential, and lowering your downside risk, right? As you pay close attention, you'll see some important distinctions. The difference between a good portfolio and a bad portfolio. The difference between a high risk portfolio and a dramatically lower risk portfolio. So Professor, what is the first biggest mistake that investors make with their retirement portfolios? Well, thank you, Becca. And, and first of all, I, I have to say, I couldn't have uh, said all that better myself. So thank you for the introduction. Um, well, I think, the, um, uh, I think the first thing we have to look at is, um, well, so the first big mistake is that people just don't uh, really allocate their portfolios as well as they could be. Um, and even more importantly, they don't really diversify in the way they, they should be doing. But, you know, first let's look at what alternative investments are, because that's what we're really talking about today. That's the subject of, of today's talk. Um, and we're looking at, you know, how we can put alternative investments into a portfolio um, to both increase the returns and, and lower the risk. Um, you know, it's kind of interesting because I, I read all the time and I teach, uh, you know, courses to MBA students and uh, many others um, in investments, uh, economics, uh, finance, and so forth. Um, and I was just reading something uh, last night. My habits to, uh, to get up in the middle of the night when the, the house is quiet and I have kind of time to myself. Um, and, and I read for one or two hours. So I'm always reading uh, new stuff. And I was actually, um, uh, I read a couple of things last night that, that sort of surprised me. Intellectually, I, I get it. But I'm still, um, you know, surprised every day by, um, by you know, just how portfolios are, are run and how they're, they're not run. Um, one of the, the things I, I just ran across in the last couple of nights is that uh, John Maynard Keynes, the, uh, the famous uh, British uh, economist um, that we you know, uh, know now as having founded what we call Keynesian economics, um, back in the uh, early 1900s, 1920s, 1930s, um, he was actually in a position where he was trying to convince King's College and other um, investment uh, you know, portfolios to uh, diversify away from what we would call today alternative investments. They were investing in a lot of real estate. He was trying to talk, uh, talk them in uh, those days um, into investing in stocks. Um, well, you know, fast forward uh, 100 years later now, um, we're, 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 we've got people investing in stocks uh, plenty. We're now trying to convince them to go back into alternative investments. Um, exactly. The other thing I'm just, yeah, and I was just reading yesterday too, um, that uh, you know, people are still talking about the 60/40 uh, stock, 60/40 um, uh, stock bond portfolio. So 60% stocks, 40% uh, bonds. And again, that's um, I, I know that that's that's what a lot of people are investing in. But it, but it, but you know, there's there's other alternatives, and that's like what we're talking about today is is the whole whole idea of uh, using alternative investment. By the way, back uh, when I was a portfolio manager with uh, Harris Bank Corp, um, we Back then, we're in the Arizona uh, subsidiary that I was working in, um, we were just starting to diversify portfolios away again, away from stocks and bonds um, into real estate. Uh, and I think this was in the mid 1980s, mid to late 1980s. And I think we were a little bit ahead of our time, at least for trust companies back then. Um, but the message has really, um, you know, been the same for a very, very long time. Um, you need to be in all the different asset classes, stocks, bonds, and alternative investments. So, you know, what are alternative investments? And um, they, they span, a, alternative investments span a very wide range of things. And we're going to talk here, I'm going to, just in a moment, I'm going to give you some examples of alternative investments. Um, but just generally speaking, and please don't hold me to this definition exactly, this is just a really rough generalization. 
But basically, an alternative investment um, is anything that's not a stock or a bond. Now, again, that's a very, very broad definition. Um, but I think that's what most people think of when we think about alternatives. And, and a lot of people, frankly, just don't understand um, you know, what alternatives uh, include. So here's some examples. Um, we've already talked about real estate. Um, uh, you know, real estate is one of the, the big asset classes for alternatives. Um, and by the way, I, I ran across, as I was doing some research for this webinar and doing and for a couple of articles I'm writing, I, I went through a list of alternatives. And although I've been at this for really 38 years, um, I, you know, some of these things even surprised me. Uh, but but they, all, they are alternatives. So here's some examples. Uh, besides real estate, there's commodities. And by the way, I don't necessarily say that we should, that you should invest in all these. But I'm just trying to give you a flavor for what uh, what the category of alternative investments includes. So real estate, uh, commodities, um, international equities, which by the way, I think most portfolios should have an allocation there. Um, high yield bonds, uh, otherwise known as, um, as junk bonds. One of the uh, school portfolios, um, uh, major university uh, portfolios that I advise um, the students, um, we're talking about their allocation to, uh, to the uh, fallen angels. That's what we oftentimes call the uh, the, the junk bond or the uh, high yield bonds. And I commented to him. I said, "So the uh, um, so the, uh, the 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 fallen angels fell a little bit further, <laughs> which they had." Um, uh, anyway, another category is private equity. Um, that's a fairly popular category these days. I think um, um, you know uh, that, that's probably a, a category that deserves some attention. Uh, we're looking at uh, private equity for our own. Uh, Northwest Quadrant Opportunity Fund. Uh, covered call writing. Now that's something that, gosh, since 1982, when I was a, a stockbroker with Bateman Actor Hill Richards out of Los Angeles, and we um, actually going back before then, uh, uh, when I was a uh, sophomore or junior in college, uh, the Chicago Board of Auctions first came into existence in 1974, I believe. Oh no. I'm beyond. Am I still on? I see my computer screen's rebooting. You just you just Can looked you out for a quick moment. Okay. You can, the oh, audio was okay. on. Which uh, part was I? Did you hear me talk about covered calls? Yes. Okay. Anyway, um, you know, we've been doing covered calls. I mean, not we in a general sense, right? Since 1974, when the Chicago Board of Options Exchange uh, came into existence, um, you know, covered call writing kind of came in. So I don't really, I've never thought of that as being an alternative investment, but, uh, but that's, that's certainly part of the category. Convertible bonds. And by the way, let me mention too that in our portfolios, and, and I think, again, this is kind of a general uh, educational call uh, for you know, people to get a sense for what, um, what alternative investing is all about. I think you should be looking at both private um, investments and alternatives as well as public. Um, and so, for example, there's some, some very good convertible bond funds. Um, but convertible bonds are considered alternatives. Um, uh, precious metals, um, preferred stocks, uh, emerging market stocks and bonds. Um, so emerging markets are the, um, you know, the smaller countries, the, the less developed countries. Um, you know, we call those emerging markets. And you know, there's, there's some, some, good, uh, you know, some good investments, um, perhaps, in some of those stocks and bonds. Let me say, though, that uh, that's an area that you know, most people, um, including us at Northwest Quadrant, we don't have any direct experience in picking um, uh, investments in, say, Chile or Peru or, you know, Yugoslavia. Uh, but that's kind of the point, too, is that there is plenty of, of expertise out there that we can tap into, and that's what we do with our, our fund. We're actually a fund of funds with Northwest Quadrant. So we're investing in asset managers that do understand the various asset classes. Even though some of the asset classes we understand very, very well, um, we're, we're still trying to choose managers um, for our own fund that really specialize in those categories. Um, That's fantastic. Funds, yeah. yeah. Let me just a couple of real other um, uh, things here real quick. So there's hedge funds, leverage buyout funds. And then one of the um, areas that we are, um, you know, looking at um, – uh, for investments is the secondary market for uh, alternative investments. So a lot of the alternative investments that we, um, uh, you know, that, that we invest in, um, you know, people will have invested maybe in a, a real estate limited partnership or something, and um, 
for whatever reason, they have to to sell that that investment. Um, maybe they need the money uh, for college, you know, for their kids or re retirement or whatever the case may be. When those when those assets go on the secondary market and we have access to those secondary markets, most people don't. Um, there's some really really good uh, uh, good bargains out there that um, that can be found. In other words, you can get those assets for um, for a uh, you know, a, a very good price, very good discount. Um, did you want to jump in there, Rebecca? Yes. So I, I just want to be clear. I'm, and by the way, the one thing I love the most about you, Dr. Paul Wendy, is how you <laughs> are able to take this amazing wealth of information, 38 years experience, and and pare it down so that we can understand. So um, what percentage should should a portfolio, a healthy portfolio, have an alternative investments what what is the percentage you would say for most people yeah you know and, and it's 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 hard to say um in a in a generalized sense because everyone's portfolio is is unique and different and, and, and you really have to look at it on a on an individualized basis um, my general sense is that probably somewhere around 20 percent is the um uh, you know is a good allocation now i was moderating a panel um because you know we're very active in the uh, alternative asset industry, and so I go to conferences of you know the people that firms that specialize in alternative assets. Um, and I was moderating a panel at, at one of these. Uh, some of my fellow panelists um, were you know saying that allocations could be as high as 40, 40 or fifty percent. You know personally, I think that's probably too high. Uh, but again, it's, it's an individualized basis. Now I, I will say that that my fellow panelists, um, uh, you know. They, they had a, a little bit of a, um, a vested interest, we'll say, in, mm. in, in alternatives, right? But right. in general, general speaking, I would say 20% is probably a good, good number to use as a starting point. That, that's fantastic. So step one to dramatically lowering your downside risk is allocating at least 20% of your portfolio into an alternative investment. Professor, let's yeah, move on to... Oh, right. and Let me just make one other point. Um, Real quick too is that I think we have to to ask you know um, uh, you know what why why we should even consider to al al consider alternative investments. So we talked about you know what they are, give some examples, how much should you allocate, but why should you even consider alternative investments in the first place? And there's really two reasons. Um, number one is that alternative investments tend to give higher returns by their very very nature, um, and as we'll talk about here in um, in the next couple of questions. Um, used properly, they can actually reduce the risk very dramatically of the um, of the overall portfolio. Wonderful, thank you so much. So, Professor, what is the second biggest mistake? So, um, the second biggest mistake, I think, is um, I'm waiting for these slides to come up. Is um, hopefully you all can see this on your screen. Um, the, the second biggest mistake that people uh, doing their portfolios is they really don't uh, diversify properly. Um, now, um, you can, you know, a lot of people think about, well, okay, if, if I diversify a portfolio, I'm going to put a bunch of assets into the portfolio um, and that'll make them diversify. You know, um, some people think that maybe putting 50 or 60 stocks, for example, into a portfolio uh, gives good diversification. Um, the real, real key to diversification is not the absolute number of, of uh, assets and investments that you put into portfolios, but it's really how they're correlated with each other. Um, so, by the way, the average correlation with the stock portfolio is about 35%. That's actually so. If you're if you're diversifying just the stocks, not considering alternatives for the moment, if you're just diversifying with um, stocks, and you have um, it turns out the number is about 25 different stocks. So, if you have like 25 stocks in the portfolio, and they're in different sectors and different industries. Then you're probably getting the benefit of that 35% um, uh, average correlation. But on the other hand, if you put into a portfolio, you put 50 different, uh, 50 banks and nothing else. You put 50 utilities and nothing else. Then you're not really diversified well because your the, the correlation between those assets uh, is very really close, probably closer to you know 80, 90% correlated with each other. This chart that we're looking at here. Uh, is what I often use with uh, with my finance and MBA classes, and it gives an example of a two 
asset portfolio, um, uh, Ford and AutoZone. Now the key is, is that um, uh, dashed black line, you notice has a slight positive slope on it. So the key is, is that we're saying that if you were to invest in, in a two asset portfolio, um, you would, uh, you know, you would invest with the expectation that both these stocks would be increasing over time. But um, as you can see from these two um, assets, you know, Ford and AutoZone, they're, as we've shown here, uh, they're negatively correlated. This is theoretical, of course. Um, so this is just for an example. But the idea here is, is that in a good economy, um, uh, you know, people are buying new cars. So Ford Motor Company might be doing well because, you know, people are buying new cars. Um, AutoZone, on the other hand, is going to do, uh, you know, better, um, relatively speaking, in a down economy because when the economy goes down, people have to keep their cars longer. Um, so they're going to be buying, you know, aftermarket parts to keep their cars running. Um, and again, this is just a theoretical example, but it kind of illustrates well how how this idea of negative correlation works. So when Ford's going up, AutoZone is going down and vice versa. Again, for this really to work is that you have to, over time, have both these stocks appreciating. But you can see what happens is that, it, we, see, we define risk in the investment world as being uh, the volatility of returns. In other words, as I always tell my students, um, you know, the, the risk is what makes your stomach upset, what keeps you awake at night, which is basically the fluctuations in the market, right? And so if you can keep those fluctuations to a minimum, and you do that by using low correlated assets with each other, um, then the, you know, when one's going up, the other one's going down, and they kind of tend to cancel each other out. Um, so that's what this chart is, is showing. Wow, Professor, that's a very powerful way to show us how, how to lower your risk while still maintaining a strong upside. Um, can you take us a little bit deeper into that strategy and explain to us how many non or low correlated investments we should have in our portfolio? Sure. We're next, waiting for the next chart to come up here. Um, so a couple of thoughts on that. Um, generally speaking, uh, you know, most investment managers and, and academics um, for a stock portfolio, uh, again, we're not, for the moment, we're not talking about alternative assets, but for a stock portfolio, um, if you have about 25 stocks in a portfolio, you're going to really um, maximize the benefits of diversification. And so, uh, let's see, this one's non-low correlated investments. Um, what this chart is showing is that, um, okay, so if we take um, over on the left-hand side of the screen, by the way, the vertical axis is the standard deviation. That's how we measure risk in a portfolio. Uh, standard deviation is just a statistical measure which measures volatility. So in other words, the ups and downs of the portfolio. And along the horizontal axis, we have um, the number of, of stocks or uh, you know, various assets that you have in the portfolio. So with a one asset portfolio, um, so we're starting out there at the very, very top left. Um, so where, yeah, thanks for all that. Your pointer is there. Where all those come together, that's a one asset portfolio where you're assuming that the asset has a 10% return and also a 10% risk, okay? Now, as we move along the horizontal axis, we're adding different assets. So uh, in this case, you know, one asset, two assets, three assets, and so forth. But at the same time, we're adding assets that have low correlations with each other. So uh, the top red line is a correlation between assets of 60%. The bottom, I can't really tell what color that is, maroon maybe. Um, that's a uh, correlation of 0%. And then they go like 60 and 40 and 30 and 20 and 0, I think, something like that. Anyway, the, the correlations decline. And you can see that as you add a number of assets and the correlations between those decrease, you're reducing the risk of the portfolio. Again, the portfolio risk is measured by the standard deviation on the um, the left uh, vertical axis that's labeled standard deviation. So that's really the, the key. Um, again, for just a stock portfolio, uh, you maximize out the benefits of diversification, typically around 25 stocks. So if you have a, a 50 stock portfolio that's well diversified, um, you're getting actually closer to being an index fund. Um, and, and again, once you hit about 25 stocks, you really maximize the benefit. It's okay to have that many, but it's you're not really accomplishing much by having more uh, uh, more stocks. That's great, Professor. So 
if I'm looking at this chart correctly, having six correlated or non-correlated, I should say, because I'm just learning this, investments are good. But if you have 15 to 20, that's even better, right? Exactly. And again, with that caveat that once we get to about 25 assets um, that are low, have low correlations with each other, then you pretty much maximize the benefits. Now, um, I think we give it, have a couple more charts coming up here where we talk about adding alternative assets. And so these lines show what happens as you add um, assets which have low correlations, again, from <clears throat> me, 60% on the top line down to 0% um, on the bottom line. But many of the alternative assets have actually lower correlate, you know, low, low to negative correlations with other assets. Um, so, you know, that, you know, that's typically, so we, we talk here about the idea of true diversification um, by adding alternative assets um, and even bringing the risk down. We have a chart which we're going to show here in a, in a couple of minutes where um, we can show mathematically that we can actually reduce the risk of the portfolio below, down below the the risk of the market. When I, when I say the market, I'm saying the, uh, the stock market, in essence, as represented by the S&P 500, um, by using um, uh, alternative assets properly, we can actually, uh, again, we can show this to you mathematically, we can actually reduce the uh, risk of the portfolio below the risk of the market while still um, achieving a higher return than the market provides. But we'll show that in a minute. Wonderful. So I just want to clarify then the step Two, to dramatically lowering your risk, we should apply true diversification, right? Correct, yes. Okay, and then Which Professor, let's, yeah. let's, um, let's move on to the third. What is the third biggest mistake? Because I know you're anxious to tell everyone. <laughs> um, okay, well, so, uh, you know, the, the third biggest mistake is, is just getting involved in investments that you really don't understand, um, um, you know, with, without, um, you know, someone that does understand that um, or, you know, doing a lot of homework or actually both. I, I really, being an educator, I really advocate that people, you know, uh, learn as much as they can about these things. Um, and so um, uh, what at Northwest Quadrant Opportunity Fund, what we do really, really well um, is to pick good managers. Um, we've been doing that for 38 years. Um, and so, again, even though we um, have had many, many, many years of experience in on, on both sides of it, as an investment bankers in, in choosing the asset classes, the asset managers, and as on the sponsor side as well. Um, uh, you know, so we have a lot of experience, particularly in the real estate arena. Um, but, you know, we want to be in other asset classes besides just real estate. Um, and, and even in the real estate arena, you know, that's a, that's a full-time job. Um, we think it's better for us to spend our time just being good asset manager selection and let the asset managers manage the assets that they do uh, really, really well, and they they uh, do well on a you know on a full time basis. The chart that just came up is the what we call the double alpha strategy. Um, alpha, as you may or may not know in the investment world, um, alpha is the return that you get um, above what would be predicted by the risk return line. So that solid black um, line that's at about a 45 degree angle uh, doesn't necessarily have to be. That just happens to be what it is. But um, that risk return line. Um, plots different assets and asset classes. So on the very, very left-hand side, uh, down at the, the, where the vertical axis, yeah, right where the pointer is right now, where the vertical return axis and the horizontal risk axis, you know, down there is, is low returns and low risk. And so the really fundamental trade-off in the investment world is if you want high returns, you have to take on higher risk, and, and the converse is true as well. If you take on high risk, then you should expect to get high returns. And you can sort of conceptually, you know, graph this out using that risk return line. Um, and so the alpha is when a manager um, is able to produce a return that is above that, uh, that risk return line. In other words, the risk return line says for any given asset asset class, what you should expect to get in terms of return would be on that line. But if you can produce better than that, then you're really doing your job as a, uh, as a you know, hedge fund or a portfolio manager. So our double alpha strategy, uh, what we're saying is that just because we've been doing this so long, and that's I think really a kind of the key to this is that you know, 38 years is a long time. I started out in 1984, um, as Becca mentioned earlier, uh, working for a firm. My, my sole job in 1984 as a very, very young guy 
uh, just starting out on Wall Street, was to do due diligence on alternative investments and um, of all kinds, <clears throat> real estate, oil and gas, equipment leasing, uh, horse farms. I had a really nice trip one, uh, one fall up to um, a, a horse farm in upstate New York uh, in, in the fall. It was just a beautiful, beautiful trip. But anyway, that's what I did is I spent you know, hours and hours and days and weeks and months um, just analyzing uh, these individual investments. And so, um, I actually forgot where I was going with that train of thought. Um, but so, <laughs> <laughs> that, happens, that happens to professors a lot. <laughs> anyway, um, <clears throat> so we, um, so, you know, we, we've been at this a long, long time and, and picking managers, uh, um, you know, asset managers that we think do a really, really good job. So that's the first level of alpha that we provide is, is that's the, the alpha that's, that, that's, that shows the vertical line um, and it, it actually so goes up to asset, asset class and manager selection. So that alpha is just the fact that we've been doing this a long time um, and you know, have some experience in, in doing that. Um, and, and again, we've been, you know, we've been able to produce um, alpha, uh, you know, just again with our Rolodex and our in our experience in doing this. The second alpha, and as I mentioned earlier, um, when you use alternative assets effectively, um, because of their low correlation, their typically low correlation characteristics with other assets in the portfolio, you can reduce the risk of the portfolio down substantially. And, um, and, and that's what we're showing there. So that little pink box, I guess it is, uh, risk reduction uh, by diversification. And, and actually, again, we can show you mathematically, um, you know, how, how it works, in, at least in a mathematical sense, how you can reduce the risk of, the port, of a, just a standard stock portfolio down below uh, the risk of the market um, by using alternative investments. And that's, so that's the second alpha. So first alpha is superior manager selection, which we strive for. The second alpha is the risk reduction. Um, by adding alternative uh, investments to a portfolio. Excellent information. So in your double alpha strategy, can you show us what a, a well diversified portfolio might look like? I don't know. <laughs> Let's see what the chart shows. Okay. <laughs> yes. Well, that's what it would look like. Uh, let's see. So again, what we're saying is that, that you would take a 60-40 uh, um, you know, 60% stock, 40% bond portfolio, add some alternative assets, um, you know, maybe uh, many of these assets that, that I mentioned before. Now, again, we're not going to necessarily invest in all these different asset classes. I just mentioned those earlier to give you a, a sense for what, uh, what the category of alternative investments includes. Um, but we're looking at, um, in, the, in the Northwest Quadrant Opportunity Fund, for example, um, you know, we're looking at adding 10 to 15 different asset managers, okay, in a number of different asset classes. So an asset manager, we sometimes call them a sponsor, um, might specialize in hotels or self-storage. Um, and, and that's all they do is that's, that's their business is to manage self-storage facilities, for example, which by the way happens to be a very, um, a very good asset class right now for a lot of reasons you can probably imagine. Um, and so we would, you know, we would pick, you know, one or two different asset managers that do really, really well with self-storage. And then we pick another asset manager that does well, um, strangely, um, uh, it might be hotels, although we have um, at least one asset manager that we're pretty close to, we've known for quite a number of years uh, in the hotel arena. And they're just doing a lot of things right. Um, and they're even losing money to, um, to buy hotels from, from distressed operators, because for obvious reasons, a lot of hotel operators just aren't gonna make it in this environment. Um, they've got some things that them, you know, very, very good at what they do. And so anyway, so we're going to have, you know, asset manager that does self storage, another one does hotels or whatever. Um, and 10 to 15 of those, of those asset managers. Now, what you have to realize too, is that they're, you know, we're, we're diversifying not only across asset managers, but across asset classes. And then each manager, so, you know, uh, say a self storage manager, might have in their portfolio uh, two to three different self-storage units. So when we actually start talking about the number of assets, it's much greater than 10 to 15. Right. Uh, it could be as many as 45 or 50. Um, and, 
and you know the what, what we offer with our fund um, uh, because you asked Becca is uh, you know the ability to get into a very very well diversified fund across you know um, 10 to 15 different asset managers and asset classes 40 to 50 maybe or 20 or 30 however many it is different assets for a very very small investment you know and a, a much greater level of diversification than most people could achieve just by uh, trying to go out and diversify to diversify that like that by themselves. Right, right. So, Professor, I just want to review what we've already learned. You can dramatically lower your risk by doing these three things. Step one is allocating at least 20% to your portfolio of your portfolio in alternative investments, applying true diversification to your portfolio, and leveraging resources to find the best managers and apply the double alpha strategy. Is that right? That's correct, yes. Wonderful. Professor, I love the quote that you have, and I think it really sums it all up. Finding a good, solid investment is important, but no one good investment can match the power of a truly diversified portfolio. Before we answer any questions from the audience, Professor, um, are you available to help clients of Next Generation Trust Company? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, yes. Wonderful. I'll, I'll go ahead and display the contact information. Any questions? All right. Let's see. I'm going to come back and join you guys on camera. I wanted Wonderful. to give you. Me. I wanted to give you uh, the attention you deserved. <laughs> we'll see if we have any questions. And sometimes it takes a minute or two for folks to to enter them in. So we'll give them a minute. And we're always available for questions after this as well. Okay. Uh, actually, I do have a quick question if, if, sure. if you're still looking for some. Um, Dr. Paul Wendy, you started mentioning um, about uh, asset the managers who, who manage the assets. Um, is it easy for someone to go out and just find all those managers, or is that something that because you have so much experience, you're able to uh, have a bigger Rolodex, if you will? Yeah. Well, yeah, and, and again, that's, that Rolodex has been building for 38 years. By the way, that gives you some idea of our age, because uh, we're still talking about Rolodex, right? Your age. <laughs> I mean, Your I, age. I, yeah, <laughs> I mentioned that somebody students they give the slides look like, what's a Rolodex? <laughs> but yeah, um, you know, we've been we've been developing those contacts. The alternative to asset uh, market, if you will, arena, is is really um, it, it's not completely fully developed yet um, and um, well and I shouldn't say it, it's just not well known yet it's it's developed from our standpoint again we've been doing this for 38 years and we know the sponsors we know the due diligence uh, team you know our our extended uh, uh, team based their due diligence firms are what I used to do when I worked for individual investment banks um, they don't typically have people like me anymore they farm everything out to uh, firms that have grown up, and that didn't. That actually kind of started happening um, after I was already in, in the industry. Firms started cropping up to just do due diligence, and so again, they're specializing. That's that's all they do is, and, and they have you know, wonderful resources to do this. So you know, we include those as part of our team when we find asset managers. Now, many of these asset managers we've just known for uh, so many years anyway, but even the ones we've known. We'll still hire the, the, the due diligence firms to go out and look at the, um, you know, really, you know, uh, kick the tires and, and you know, just do all the legal background checks and the, uh, you know, look, review the assets, uh, uh, run projections. Um, you know, I mean, it's, it's a very, very thorough due diligence job um, uh, that, that they do. So, um, but again, that's, you know, we, we know the investment banks, we know the due diligence firms, we know the sponsors. Um, uh, you know we're we're part of the we're part of the industry. We, we go to the conferences, we speak to the conferences, and so forth. I also wanted to mention um, just uh, just yesterday I mentioned that there's a secondary market for some of these limited partnership interests, and we do take advantage of that secondary market because um, there are some really very very good bargains out there. Well, this um, this little communication I got from one of the firms that we work with, if I can find it here, they basically said. Um, so, so they're they're like a secondary marketplace where you can go in and buy alternative assets. That are, what's nice about the secondary market is that these are assets that are usually seasoned. So, you know, someone may have 
um, you know, a firm, a sponsor, um, may have started, say, a real estate uh, project, an apartment building or a self-storage unit three or four years ago, okay? And then someone that bought one of those interests um, in, the, um, in that partnership um, or LLC, whatever the structure is, now has to sell it because their kids are going to college or they're going to retire or, you know, whatever the case, they've lost their jobs. And so it goes on these secondary markets and there's, they're usually priced at, at pretty steep discounts. But not only are you getting a good buy in terms of the price, but you also have a seasoned asset. And you can see this, this is an asset when the original person bought it, it was a brand new, you know, a brand new project, or at least to the sponsors brand new. Now the sponsors had it for two to three years. We can see how it's been performing. Um, right. So here, here was a, a little piece that came in uh, just, uh, I wrote this down to be able to um, uh, to be able to quote it. Um, so this is again from the firm that that runs one of these secondary marketplaces. Uh, it says we have in quote we have institutional buyers, institutional buyers, okay, actively looking to purchase uh, larger share quantities of the REITs below, and it listed a, a bunch of REITs. Um, so the institutions get it. They've been doing this. The large institutions have been doing this for a long time. The Black Rocks and and so forth. Um, what we really do is kind of bring this down to, um, you know, the, the high net worth individual, the accredited investors, the small pension funds, family offices, and so forth, um, and and provide, you know, kind of that expertise and that, um, uh, you know, just that experience and that Rolodex of being able to, uh, to find these. Wonderful. Thank you. Brittany, were there any questions? Um, I don't see any. However, we still do have... Uh, a group of attendees on that are listening. So if I can ask a question without putting <laughs> Dr. Paul Wendy on the spot. Um, <laughs> so, so we talked about we talked about alternatives and allocating them into an investment portfolio. Um, so one of the things that I think our listeners are aware of that we assist with is um, ways to utilize not just an investment re uh, portfolio, but a tax advantaged retirement account in order to incorporate alternative assets. So do you have any comments on that angle as yeah. a strategy and the benefits of that? Oh, oh, absolutely. And, and you know, um, I'm glad you I actually was going to bring that point up and I'm glad you reminded me. Uh, you know, the, the self-directed IRA is just an excellent vehicle to be able to do this. We've actually been doing this, you know, again, I've been doing this for 38 years. Um, I, I don't know how long. It probably goes back to 1984 when I started doing this. Um, but, you know, and, and a, lot of, a lot of people don't realize just how a self-directed IRA, for example, or other retire, types of retirement plans can be so beneficial. You know, people oftentimes think that in their IRA, they have to buy you know, um, uh, you know, stocks or you know, mutual funds that are traded um, on, on one of the exchanges, but n not at all. And um, and it's really, uh, you know, it's really just a great thing that people do have, like the vehicles that uh, that your company, Brittany, provides to be able to buy these kinds of assets. So yeah, I've um, uh, when I was on both sides as an investment banker as well as on the, the sponsor side, we would set up uh, self-directed IRAs all the time uh, so that people could, um, you know, could use them to make these kinds of investments. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. And <laughs> I think, um, and one of the things that as you were talking, I was thinking about maybe some of the common mistakes that self-directed IRA holders might make or some of the issues they might come up against throughout the course of using a self-directed IRA. And I think one of them is getting into alternative investments that they don't fully understand. Um, right. And I think that, and that ties back to, I think it was your number two or part of it. And where your knowledge comes in and is important is we act as a custodian for these accounts, meaning that we can help set them up. Um, we hold the retirement accounts and we provide all of the necessary reporting and and record keeping on these accounts and obviously assist with the transactions uh, associated with the investments. But because we're not fiduciaries, uh, we don't have the ability to perform that due diligence for them. 
So in some cases, right. investors are coming into these decisions with either limited due diligence or no due diligence. Um, maybe it's a recommendation that they got from a friend to invest in a specific you know, private stock or uh, maybe a specific real estate fund. And that's okay. And of course, investors are free to choose their own. And that's part of the beauty of having the self-directed IRA. But if they're really looking for some more insight and expertise behind the decisions that they're making, then understanding this is important as well. And I just wanted to point that out because I think it's a compliment to what we do. <laughs> yeah, I, I think we probably should have put down, uh, Becca, and we should put down the fourth big mistake that people make is they don't do the due diligence. And I can, you know, I can tell you the horror stories I've seen in, in 38 years. Um, it's, it's tough. I mean, and, and that's why we spend, uh, well, and, and I guess the nice thing is I'll just, I'll tell you one of the little, um, uh, the, the, the one of the uh, true kept secrets of the industry is that um, the due diligence that, that we, in essence, hire to be done, we actually don't have to pay for that. Um, it's kind of like like a, a firm, you know, that's getting a CPA to do an audit on them. All right, the firm's going to pay the CPA. The investor doesn't pay the CPA. Well, it's, it works the same in the due diligence arena, which is great because some of these due diligence um, assignments can be $25,000 or more. Um, and and the, the sponsors of these investments are willing to pay that because, again, because we're all part of this investment banking community um, and community of, of uh, you know, firms that deal with alternative investments all the time, um, they're not spending $25,000 just for us and then $25,000 for somebody else. They spend the money and everyone that's part of this community can use it. And that's, that's what does happen. But the point is, is that we have some you know, these due diligence firms that we hire will spend, you know, uh, you know, several, you know, two to three months at least uh, looking at these these companies and their investments, and then we'll be doing ongoing due diligence as well. Um, so it's a very expensive, very lengthy process. And if you don't do that again, in 38 years, um, it, you know, it's, I, I've just seen cases. I mean, it's it's even tough when people do everything right. Um, but if if you don't do the due diligence, it's almost a you know almost a recipe for a disaster. <laughs> right. Yeah, I think I think we have many investors have been successful using self-directed IRAs, but one of the factors into having the success, especially long term, is the education behind knowing what you're investing in and getting into. So um, I think that part is really important, and I don't. I don't know that it's emphasized enough in in sort of the self-directed IRA community in terms of conversations that people might be having and like the word of mouth that's spreading around it and maybe even the way that it's sometimes marketed to people. Um, I don't think that part is stressed enough uh, because, of course, people want to hear that, you know, it's easy. You just pick your own investments and everything's great and you're going to, you know, you're going to accelerate your return on investment and and obviously that's that's a real possibility um but i think in order to increase the probability that it actually happens <laughs> you still have to do the work behind it um Absolutely. So, so yeah definitely important all right let's see i don't think we have any other questions i think you've probably given our listeners a lot to think about <laughs> and take in We'll do a time check. We have a few minutes. Um, are there any other closing comments that you'd like to make or any other points that we missed? Becca, did you have anything that we should be adding? Or let me look my notes I don't. Quick. I, I'm actually really excited that we made it through. Um, I feel like, like I said before, Paul, your, your genius is the fact that you can take these complex things that you're doing and all this knowledge you have and pare it down into three or even four, Brittany, easy steps for everyone. Um, no, I think just in closing, there, there's all of, of the contact information for Dr. Paul Wendy. He's already said that he'd be happy to help your 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 clients with anything, any questions that they have. And um, again, it's been a pleasure to present today. And Becca, the, uh, Becca, the, the genius, actually, if, if, if I grew my hair out, the genius you would see is just the gray hair, having been around <laughs> I just pictured an Albert Einstein 
Yeah, like, right. Yeah, exactly. Out of your head. <laughs> and that's exactly what it's like. <laughs> that's what it would be. <laughs> it seems appropriate. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> Absolutely. No, I, I appreciate the time from both of you today and all the knowledge that you brought um, to our group. Um, obviously, you know, not an area of expertise for us. So we're happy to be able to offer something unique and different. And we appreciate your willingness to um, to share and contribute all of that. So, Absolutely. Um, and Brittany, any any time we'd love to do this. I mean, yeah, that's what that's what our program is all about is educating and empowering. So anytime you like us to write something, do something, we're here for you. Yep, and as are we, we're really motivated to educate as well, as you know. Um, we really want to, I think we all want to set investors up to be successful, right? We just want to see Absolutely. people be successful and be educated and feel really good about the decisions that they're making and the path that they're taking. So exactly. the more we can continue to do that, the better everyone will be. Uh, with that, um, thanks everybody for joining us today. We really appreciate it. And we also hope that everybody is safe and healthy uh, during this crazy time. Um, it really is, it really is something, something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but with that, with that said, I think um, just a closing comment would be that it's also a good time as you probably have all thought about this to be having these conversations because we've seen what the market can do uh so anyone who's listened to this today and took the time out of their day to educate themselves um in a proactive way is putting themselves in a good position uh to really get ahead of um you know most others when it comes to to, to finding ways to hedge against further volatility, right? So we, this isn't, I'm sure this isn't the last volatility, uh, you know, that we're going to yeah. see, right? It's a roller coaster. Oh, no. so we got to ride the roller coaster, but we got to be smart about what we're doing on it. So buckle in. Um, hopefully it's been helpful. Yeah, buckle in for sure. <laughs> and uh, for anybody who would like more information, uh, we'll be following up uh, within a day or so with an email to everybody, and we'll have contact information for our speakers, and we'll also have a recording of the webinar. So if you would like to have a one-on-one -on -one discussion, or maybe uh, you think about this and some other questions come up and you feel more comfortable discussing them at a later date, um, we are all accessible. Um, so thanks again. Um, everybody stay safe. Have a wonderful rest of your week, and hopefully we'll be talking to you soon. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.